Hello, I'm Simon Parker and welcome to the Naked Record Club. If you don't know what the Naked Record Club is, get online, have a look at uh, nakedrecordclub.com. We make the world's greenest vinyl. We are in fact the only uh, green eco record label in the world. And today is a really special day because we are approaching the release of our very first album. And I'm so excited to say that it's uh, a brilliant album by an artist I've loved for a very long time. Uh, and that is Baby Bird's King of Nothing album. And as you can see, we have Stephen, a.k.a. Baby Bird, with us today. Stephen, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Brilliant. It's great to see you. Yes, and you. Yeah, finally. Yes, we've After been talking for a while now about this. Conversation in Sainsbury's car park. Yeah, that always seems to go well. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, 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 doing good the shopping. Well, maybe it was getting you out of doing the shopping. Yes, well, I've been to the gym, actually, yeah. I, you know, we'll talk about that later. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'm not proud of going to gyms, <laughs> but I have to. It's well, more than life. <laughs> yeah. So, King of Nothing, a fantastic album, um, part of a huge catalogue. Um, I'm sure most of viewers of this will know, but you are one of England's best singer-songwriters and very prolific, which I really want to talk about today. I was on your bank. I'm not page. In, but yes. Yeah, you're yeah, not in. But I saw... Ba um, Baby Bird releases alone on Bandcamp, which is your sort of new platform for how you, how you sell your music these days or present your music. Mm, yeah. There's something like 86 releases. Well, you say it's 100, 140. Oh, from Baby Bird, from Baby yes. Bird. Yeah, I was going to yeah, come from the, uh, yeah. to Trucker and Black yeah. Reindeer and some yeah. of these other things as well. I mean, and you yeah. factor them in. So where do you find the time to do Which this? Which it creates loads of problems, I think, actually, having that much music. Because... <laughs> Because that's why I tried to separate it up into different genres as well, so people could yeah. pick different things. But um, yeah, I've just always done that. That's, it's, I started with the the, the lo-fi albums, which was yeah. kind of cold from four hundred things I did on the dole. You know, I was on the dole for five years, so I recorded stuff on a cassette. So I, I did it to kill the time. So that hasn't gone away. I mean, obviously, if we're touring or doing something else, and I don't have the time to do it. Um, but that has stayed with me since I was, what, 25, 26? So if you're not touring, do you find that you do something every day? Is it like a, not a compulsion, but something but, that you... Yeah, it's funny, but I think people think I'm up in my room, you know, locked up in a room 24 hours a day, but it's, it's not like that at all. I just think I write very, very quickly. So I write one song or a piece of music, and then it comes out as six altogether. So I'll do six yeah. pieces, springboard from, from one to another, so they're kind of similar in a way. And then I go and sing on them later, but it's just... Just, I don't feel like I work hard. I just feel like it's something, one thing in life I can do is play a piano and record it, that's all. <laughs> and that's how all the songs start, with a piano line? Uh, no, usually with a, a, a loop or something, and then I'll play piano. Means, yeah, and then, yeah. yeah, but I haven't played guitar for a very long time, just simple reason that I break strings and I, I never put them back on again. And so I just stick with well, guitar. Like, yeah, you and know, you can play piano, guitar yeah. on a piano now anyway. See, the sounds of, I can get on a piano with your guitar sounds amazing. So. I know you've said um, throughout your career uh, that you're kind of staunchly lo-fi. Has your recording technique or your setup changed a great deal over yeah, the years? Yeah, it's just whatever's quickest and easiest. I think, you know, people always suggest things like Pro Tools or go and do something, you know, on, yeah. on, a, on an Apple thing more. But I've always had Garage Band, which is basically cut and paste, just put your loop in, yeah. make it go, do some piano, loop it, and it's, it's just whatever's easiest. So I've gone through all the things. I've gone through cassettes. I've gone through mini discs, all these things that have, have kind of like disappeared. Well, mini cassettes discs. have come back a bit. The yeah. mini discs will yeah. never come back, I don't think. But um, yeah, no, just 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 whatever's whatever's quickest. And I hate all this this rubbish of people buying thousand pound speakers. And you know, when we used to go into studios with Baby Bird, there would be you know a shitty cassette player which covered in paint. I remember, <laughs> and that's what the, the the guy who was producing at the time would just put it would put it on cassette, put it in there, and see if it sounded right. See it, you know? Yeah, the car kind of test and. And that's, that's always the best way to test it. Anyway, just stick it in a car stereo, put it yeah. on a CD. And, and yeah, it's right. You go to, to a studio that is, it has the best speakers, sort of these sort of massive speakers that are in yeah. this room here. But at the end of the day, that can actually be, it, it can put you off what you're actually trying to achieve as well, because it sounds yeah. so amazing. You, you take a recording out maybe and then go, oh, Christ, does it sound like this? What have we done? Yeah. How, how do we add the... The yeah. scars back into this. No, I know taking exactly. It all out. No, exactly. Well, I've always used a ten-pound microphone. It was a, it was a cheap microphone that came with my daughter's keyboard, one of these Casios, and it was a microphone, and it was ten quid for the whole thing, a second-hand yeah. shop. 
And I've used that forever. Yeah, quite expensive. (laughs) Yeah, for me, yeah. (laughs) No, but I've used this mic for ages, and I just know that for me it sounds good because my hearing's not perfect. It sounds good, but I know that I get the odd person saying it's a bit crackly on this song and stuff, so you have to, you know, ride your way through that. So I should say uh, we are coming to you today from Altrincham, uh, the fantastic people at the Cheshire Tap have given us this lovely location. So thanks to Chris and the team for doing that. Uh, we'll be sharing all this on social media so you can find where it is and come and buy your drinks here. Yeah. Um, into King of Nothing. Um, what are your memories of writing that album? Um, probably the first time since... So we, so we had five lo-fi albums, which was just me. Yep. And then um, very, very DIY stuff. And then it became... You know, we had people after us and we, we signed a record company and then a band became involved and we would we, we would record songs in a batch. But I hadn't done that for a long, long time until King of Nothing. So it was, I think, 35 demos all wow. together at the same time. And they stuck together as a unit, which is very rare. Very often, you know, put I'd take a song and I'd put it somewhere else. Yeah. But th- that was that was the reason. And it just it just clicked and then Danny heard them and Danny worked on them and it's it's just not happened since very early Baby Bird the band. Yeah. So it was it just they just sound very dynamic and they do fit together. They fit, yeah, it really yeah. felt like that was and that's a quite a rare yeah. thing. It's quite yeah. a rare thing without yeah. it being a concept album, you stick it all together for a, it, it's it's too much of a um you're pushing it too hard, but this this slotted really nicely. So Do you remember what was the first song written for the album? Um, I think King of Nothing, probably. Really? Yeah, yeah. I think that was the, f- the first one. I was with a manager who wanted to go and remix it and put a rap on it. It's just appalling. No, I know you well, like hip hop. So <laughs> I love hip hop, but just for this, for this suggestion was such a... I'm not with this manager anymore, but his suggestions were never great. So I noticed that um, the album on Bandcamp, anyway, is quite spread out. How long mm. do you think it was from start to finish, as it were? I know there was 35 songs, so it's probably a while, but it's, it seemed to be that it, it came out in, in, in bits and pieces. Well, it frustrated me because I don't think it... I wanted more people to hear it, and I think this is why this is great, doing it, doing it with you. It's, right. it's like, right. I, I just feel like... I think it, even some of the songs are repeated along the way a little bit. I just think people might have missed it. You know, Bank yeah. Up is really small. Yeah. It's... it's it's almost too big for me because I do a lot of I do a lot of design the sleeves and stuff. So it's yeah. too, it's almost too much work for me, but it's very small. So I think you know just to to have other people and to put it on vinyl. I mean that's that's something I would not get the opportunity to do. Unless, Brilliant. Well, we're going we'll, we'll, to we'll you. come to that. We're going to yeah. go in through this. But one question to do with the vinyl is that of course we added two tracks. You kindly yes. sent us a whole bunch of songs. Mm. Obviously. The album was nine songs, I believe, mm. the, the original Bandcamp yeah. King of Nothing album. So it's now an 11 track um, album. What did you make of our choices on the two tracks that we added, which were Blood Money and Happiest Girl? No, perfect. No. I mean, I yeah. to be honest, I would have been happy with any. Uh, Blood Money is a good one because that wasn't one that was, that was, that was kind of something that I think there's some shallow like, bubble bars on it or something yeah. that it, it didn't have those for a long time. And when you put a little thing on it, it tweet, it was one of those songs that I wouldn't have put on the, the nine or the, or the 11, but, but now it's, it's one of those ones that's uh, become one of my favorites, I think. So Brilliant. the happiest girl is, 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 you know, it's very personal, really. It's about, it's not about a specific person, but it'll be about, you know, uh, my daughter or, or my partner or you know it's it's uh you, you just want someone to be happy so i think it's, yeah. clearly it's, yeah it's as simple as that really it's it it's i think it's one of your best songs i love it i absolutely when yeah, i heard that I, for the first time it's one of those moments where i was like wow what oh, song. that's brilliant yeah, yeah. Oh, it's good, just good. like wow yeah. it really really slapped me yeah. around the face um have you got a favorite song on the album i know the first one was king enough and written favorite song um yeah love life love that's life. that's the song yeah. when i was living in in hail actually just around the corner from here um yeah, I think I listened to that probably about 50 times over and over and, and, and drifted off to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, it was still, it was still playing <laughs> on a little hip. Really? It had been all night? Yeah, yeah. It. So it's, I, think, I think that's, that's whether I think I like it or I don't know if I've been indoctrinated from that <laughs> evening. <laughs> I've listened to it 50 times. But, but it was, is... that, again, was just so simple. And I, I, I like songs that I've... I listen back that I can't remember how I played them. There's piano pieces on that which I don't understand, t- t- twiddly bits that yeah. I don't normally do, and I don't know where the hell that comes from. So, when really? I remember how they were made, which I quite like. You're in a boogie woogie. 
I've been watching, no. I've been watching your George <laughs> Holland pieces, and I want to talk about Oh, yeah, that yeah, later. yeah. I started yeah. a couple of Yeah, very we just support things, the Boogie yeah. Woogie King, but yeah, not a fan of Boogie Woogie. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody is apart from Jules. Oh, God, this is going to get a few haters, isn't it, if we have this, this in the interview? Okay, so we'll come back to King of Nothing in a bit. I'd yep. like to um, move back in time, if that's okay, to Ooh, your, yes. your childhood and growing up, mm. if that's okay. So, mm. where were you born? I was born in Wellington, which is next to Telford, which became, when I was growing up, I was only there till I was four, but it became one of the biggest, um, I think one of the, before Milton Keynes, it became one of the biggest sprawls, urban sprawls kind of right. states. So horrendous, but but we were in Wellington, which was the leafy part. So, yeah, <clears throat> I believe I believe I think with most people's lives, I don't remember any of these things. You obviously don't remember, so, but there's so much stuff I don't remember. So I think you're like six or seven different people during your life. Yeah, That's something too profound. But <clears throat> so I, I kind of look at the old photos. That my mum was a black and white photographer, so and I used to she she took me into dark room and and we did all the kind of you know putting it in all the solutions. That's like stuff. magic when you first. Oh, amazing, that. amazing! So I'll never forget with the red light, and I'll, I'll yeah. never forget. It sounds, it sounds weird, doesn't it? But. Um, <laughs> It was it, it just just brilliant. So uh, I think that's my memory is based on those photographs that she took. But I, I look at the boy and it doesn't even look like me. So it's weird, isn't it, when you look at something when you well, were four or five or three or... It's, I mean, it is, I mean, it's such a different person. I see pictures of myself and once upon a time I had legs that looked like the normal <laughs> legs before they became weird matchsticks. <laughs> just about support yeah. the upper part of my body. Yeah, yeah. like, at one point I was fairly normal, but, you know... Um, yeah, you spent time in New Zealand? I did, yes. We went to New Zealand. My mum and dad are teachers. Um, and we went, uh, if you had 50 quid, which was quite a lot of money then, I think. But if you had a, a, enough money, you could not pay, but you can. You had a job, you could go to New Zealand. So we went to New Zealand on a, on a, a Greek liner called the Himalaya. So we were on this boat for 36 days, going through the Suez Canal and past... Do you remember bits of this? Or have you no, again, again, not on the way there, but on the way back. I, I can remember, I remember certain things. When I came back, I was seven. So I was seven, as I used to, because I had a New Zealand accent. So we went that way and we went past Tahiti. We stopped in Tahiti and Sri, Sri Lanka and well, when it was Ceylon. Um, and you, you'd go to New York and you'd go there over Christmas and it was just, you were there for, you know, like a cruise ship it was. Yeah. You'd go over and watch it. And I just remember it being very snowy. Um, and then, yeah, and then I stayed in New Zealand for... Which is really weird as well, because New Zealand is was incredibly lush, and I yeah. it, it really really green, and it, you remember you really remember that. But all the photos are black and white, so that's weird. Effing my head up. A bit, yeah, you know. that's a strange memory. So I stayed there for for four, four years, or well, four to sets of four years, um, and then came back the other way. So through the was it the Panama Canal, Panama Canal, and stopped off in Sydney. And yeah. do you have brothers and sisters? Did you share? Yeah, this well, this is, well, this is what's really weird because my sister was eighteen months. So my brother was 18 months younger than me. So I was four. So he was, what, two or two and wow, whatever. pretty and she, young. She was 18 months. And I think, I think my, my dad's family particularly were quite horrified that we, were, we weren't going to... They could have gone to Canada, you yeah. know, halfway around the world, but they decided to go to the edge of the world, yeah. which is, was seen as the edge of the yeah. world. You drop off the edge. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing that's cropped up recently with my sister and my, my dad being a bit ill is... What, what, quite a strange thing to do. Yeah. And I think it was, we, we went there for life. That was it. We were going there forever. Um, but my dad didn't get a job. So it was like a, you know, it was like a tiny little mini, mini item. What's the word? Minute Min thing. My <laughs> minuti? No, whatever. Yeah, get, minuti. Uh, yeah. Dad, you can read it and know yeah. what it means, but you try to say it. It's minute. It's not minute. Uh, so, so yeah, so it was, it was a thread basically that we came back, but I, you know, and that, that's, I, the only thing is that I wouldn't have met my partner. I wouldn't have had my kids. You know, it, it's quite a. Is your partner from New Zealand? No no, 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 no. But I wouldn't have come back, and I oh, wouldn't, I see. Yeah, I wouldn't course, have done course, Baby yeah. Bird. I probably would have stayed in New Zealand, and I don't know, looked after dolphins or something, because it was that ideal. We used to run to school on the beach, you know, in bare feet, and uh, yeah, it was a, it was a, a lovely. So when you came back, time. where did you end up after this idyllic? Well, we we went to. Um, I think I we went to Repton, which is a public school, which my dad got a job in a public school, which I actually went to, so I am a public school boy. By, instead of £2,000, 50 quid, if your dad teaches there, you could get, get in. in. So, 
which I didn't enjoy at all. But um, yeah, so Repton, and we again we moved around. The more senior he got in the school, the, we could move to houses. So it's very nomadic. My family is like we, you know, on one street. I think we lived in five different houses. So wow. it's always moving, always moving. And so I, I've always got that in my head. I mean, I've been in Hale. I was in London for 15 years and I thought, yeah. my God, how could I have stayed in one place? So it's always eating away at me that because of the way my parents brought me up. So, yes, yeah, so, so, so Repton and then, then I went to, to show, carry on the... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. No, then I did our foundation at Derby and then I did creative arts, which is a real Mickey Mouse course, which has gone <laughs> long gone. So you would choose dance, art, music or um, what's, the, what's the other discipline? Theatre. Right. Um, yeah, so I did that. So I did drama and arts at um, Creative Arts. Great. So which was very weird, yeah. At school, um, did you have any good teachers or a a any people who encouraged you? Because about, you were yeah. writing. Did you not write stories from a young age? Or you, you were doing something, weren't you, quite creative I from a young, young age? I was doing shit poetry, I remember, which I've thrown away, which is really annoying because I think it'd be nice to see how terrible it is. But I chucked it away. I used to do photo montage as well of... Um, and sticking stuff together and, and putting them in these books and but I, I just remember my handwriting was really good but the, the words were terrible but I threw it away which is mental um yes so I you did have good did you have any good teachers I asked no because a I was lot of musicians about, no I was thinking about this the other day I don't it's like a lot of people always talk about their favorite teacher but I never had like a teacher that stuck out at all I, I remember maybe a guy that did did when I was doing art a level um, but I, I don't remember him particularly. I remember the things he taught, which was like Joseph Boyce, you know, the performance artist. He, he did things like this kind of really opened my eyes. It's, it's like to, to it, it wasn't just a, he, I don't even remember his name, but he would teach us not just, uh, you know, still lives and stuff. Yeah. Joseph Boyce was a guy that um, he became really famous. He would sign his cigarettes and sell them for <laughs> thousands and thousands of pounds. But he did things like an installation. He was in a, in like a glass room that he built with two wild wolves. So, and he just had a blanket and he was in there for two, you know, like David Blaine stuck himself in a box. I've seen all that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a bit like um, that performance art and people sitting in baked beans, in baths full of baked beans. So he introduced me to all this stuff, which, you know. You've done a baked bean sleeve. I have, yeah, yeah. That was that was quite funny. That was in um, that was actually used in the Virgin Flight magazine. You know, on the Virgin planes, they put <laughs> that because the corner shop. Yeah, no, no, it should have been for breakfast. I would have stuck everything, you know, sausage and black pudding on. But no, it was um, yeah, it was me with beans on my head yeah. making a joke. Corner shop. It's yeah. just a, a joke which yeah. I don't think helps your career in any way. <laughs> But that was kind of probably good talking about performance art, but that's kind of what I did before Baby Bird. Right. Performance art theatre. When did you start writing songs then? When I, when I came out of, I think I used to, who else was talking about this the other day? No, I, I think in terms of music, I would always play on the piano. I was never, I was forced to play the flute, which was horrendous. You know, the school thing you do at my son. At the you moment. ended up with a flute, did you? Yeah. It, no, just the worst instrument, you know, something out. The, yes. I think you need something out the front yeah. or down here, yeah. but it's just like coming out. This is just an unpowerful <laughs> instrument. So I, I did that for, for eight years, but my mum my and dad always had a piano. So they never forced me to, apart from the flute, they never forced me. So the piano was something I just gravitated towards and would record it on cassettes and stuff. So I suppose that's the first time I was doing music. And then I had a school band. It was Joy Division time. That's how old I am. But well, I was going to speak to you about this by. because you seem to me to have been the right age for punk. If you were no, I was it. no, I was. I, I could have. That's the frustration. I was. I was just too young by a couple of years, really. Right. Okay. So seventy-seven. I was um, fifteen. Yeah. So. So no. Well, not no too Higgins young. But not too young. But I, I was kind of. It's, it wasn't like until the sixth form that I could go and see. Cockney Rejects, UK Subs and Throbbing Gristle, all these these bands that I used to go and see. So I had to, it was kind of just after The Stranglers, so it was 79. Yeah. And Joy Division, of course, when, yeah. that, when that came yeah. along, changed changed everything musically. I've heard some of your covers of Joy Division. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I was cool. playing Atmosphere yesterday before I came up and that's a fantastic cover, yeah. you know. What's it like covering? I've never thought to cover a Joy Division song, but what's it like? Is it like... It's, pretty, it's probably, you just think, oh, it's a bit big, big headed, but I know it would only go to a few fans. It wasn't like a, a big thing, but yeah. it was, 
just um well i've i've done i used to do that a lot i did blueberry hill and and these things but it was like i took the original recording and played it backwards and this is when i was sort of 18 19 so right. I've, I've always pissed about with that but you, it's Ill illegal obviously so i just thought i would do, would do that with with joy division yeah and no, it's 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 really it's really weird without to being show busy stories, but it's like I've I've your your idols. I've I've met quite a few of my idols just through doing Baby Bird and being on a dance floor with with Barney Sumner. Just he was blowing a whistle off his off his head, but we were dancing on a dance floor, for, and Moby was DJing. It was very very odd, and also um, Peter Hook as well. He yeah. puts his cat he puts his cat into the same category as we do, but he's he's a bit of a. I don't know if he's a very approachable person. He looks scary. Yeah. He's pretty scary. Yeah, but that was surreal. He was in his massive Range Rover, and I think he's got, I think his number plate is Hooky or something. So yeah. it's Mr. I in case he loses his car properly. Of course, yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, yeah so, so, so very bizarre. And, and like, um, all you, all, all the people have, like Paul Weller, I was, it, I was sat in, it was a bit like this, it was in a studio in, in, in sorry, I've just said too many show busy, they're not show busy no, stories because they're always ending a bad thing. But um, no, my, my daughter was two and he, Paul Weller was there. We weren't really talking, I didn't speak to him or anything. We were just yeah. watching TV and she poured coffee down my, I was wearing a white shirt and she poured coffee down there and that was my, that was my <laughs> sitting with Paul Weller. So <laughs> every time I've been in the, the same place with someone like that, it's, it's a, a disaster, which I like, which I think is brilliant. So, you know. so obviously Joy Division when you are a teenager, big band for you. Yeah. Who else were you into around that sort of Stranglers time? probably. Yeah. Yeah, I think I used to go to the um, assembly rooms in Derby and um, Jean-Jacques Bonnell went into the audience with a bass. I didn't actually see it and whacked someone across the head. Oof. Got back on stage and carried on. So, right. so the, those are the memories I remember. Brilliant. This but, is what um, you use a bass guitar for. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's horrific. But I think when you're, you know, you've had a few drinks and you just think it's, oh, you didn't really hit that person, but he, he did. I think the person was taken out. And... Yeah, so no, I, I'm trying to think. It was. It just seems Joy Division, Joy Division. That was it. That was because of the bass playing and the fact that it was melodic. Yeah. And I, I played bass, so I oh, would do you? that. Oh, did you? Right. And I had my dad's old reel-to-reel Zephyrograph. -reel right. Which I kind of lost, and that would never have been forgotten. But you could plug it. You could plug a bass into it, and it had speakers. You didn't use the reel-to-reel -reel bit, and you just played. And it's like a mini amp. It, it was. A, yeah, it had sound. an amp. So yeah, yeah. so it was, it, that was my first amp. Uh, it was beautiful, green thing. It's probably worth a lot of money now, but I lost it. So, um, yeah, so I'd play that and I was in a band um, at school when I was sort of 17, 18. And, yeah, it was, it was Joy Division stuff that we would be... But you we weren't were, the singer? You weren't at that point? You no, were I, don't think I, I don't think I was. I think um, when I moved to Nottingham, when I was 20 or so, I'd, I'd started to do singing, but I, I, not seriously. It was always from... Um, Doing, doing the when I when I did the performance art theatre stuff, I did the soundtracks for that. So yeah. there was no singing on it. I might have used a few found voices and stuff, but it was it wasn't. I didn't think I could sing basically. Really, I, I had no I, I idea. Just think you've no got idea. one of the most distinctive <laughs> voices. Uh, it's just a fantastic voice, and I think <laughs> as you get older, mm. much like I think John Lydon as well, who's sort mm. of become an opera singer now. I saw Pill play a few years back. Oh yeah, yeah. and you know I'm sure he would say he's not the world's technically most gifted singer. He's probably never had a lesson in his life, but it was really powerful. And I think your voice, album by album, just becomes stronger and stronger. It's hugely okay. identifiable as well. It's, it's brilliant. Do you still yeah. think that you, you, do you think you can sing I, at this point? Oh, um, yeah, I can sing. Yeah, but I, I don't blow, you know, I sing. It's just, just I'm, in, I'm in the fourth, fourth bedroom in the box room <laughs> and I sing there. And you know, if I'm too loud, someone will come in and say, Dad. Dad. No, that's that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. So that's never changed. You know, I was doing that in a in a flat in Nottingham when I was, you know, when I started singing properly. And, you know, I would always have to keep it down or but yeah, yeah. it's just something I don't you don't think about it really. I think I'm really lucky that I haven't had to get a proper job and I can do stuff like that, but I don't I I don't quantify it's just nice if you if you say it's a nice voice, then that, that's yeah. enough, really. I, I, I think, you've got I think if you think you've got a great voice, then you're you're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about you. You touched on it earlier, um, being on the dole mm. and writing songs. Obviously, nowadays I don't think that would be even possible to do because job centres are 
like prisons. They, they look terrible. Um, yeah. And I, I don't think you could do that. But certainly during the era of Thatcher, mm. when certainly in the north of England, they sort of just left and just like, well, we won't worry about that too much. A lot of musicians actually did exist on the dole. You could do that. So you'd gone to yeah, was... college and then you, you, you were in working with a drama group. That's right. Well, I, I don't, it's like I was saying, the performance art, people think of someone sat in, I, mean, I don't even know how many, but, but it's like when I was, at, I was saying when I was doing my A-levels and we were being introduced to this weird stuff, like a man in a thing yeah. with wolves and stuff, and it would be someone sat in and baked beans for a week. You know, it was nice. the terrible stuff. Yeah, it's just <laughs> rubbish, but it's it's like, um, I don't know, Salvador Dali, someone like that would do, would, it was a performance artist in, yeah. in some ways, and he did, he did a lot of adverts, and he went on to be quite big in, on Spanish TV and stuff, really bizarre. But you take you take the 1%, which was good, and hopefully we, we did that. Um, it was called Dogs in Honey, and it was someone I met on my course, my creative arts course, when I started doing the soundtracks for that. And we we performed, but we didn't we didn't like the whole theatre, you know, make yeah. everything big. So we would use cameras, we would use everything we could, microphones, anything to do. Instead of doing like a monologue, you'd do a stand up thing. So we would try and change it, but make it unusual, but but change it. Was it influenced by David Lynch a lot? So right. I think we'd try and work that into a razor head. I was going to say that would work have been a razor head. In that yeah, period of time. I think that was that was more of an influence than any performance art. But some performance art's brilliant. It's um, uh, Maria Bramovich, who's done a lot of, um, she's done a lot of uh, amazing things, but but a lot of it is crap. But you take the the one two percent of it that's good and try and use it for us, and we we did that. Do you still check in with that sort of thing now? I think if no, I like unusual things. You know, yeah. I, I still I want I, I've, I've actually bought a razor head, so I want to watch that again because I think that's just just. I can't remember that. I, I always worry that I'll go back and watch it. And thinks it's awful. I liked it when I was in my twenties. Yeah, no, it's awful. But I've seen clips of it. Let's do. It's fantastic. Yeah, I just uh, love the feeling. Yeah. Of it. Uh, let's just finish off in that time then. Um, so you were you were writing um, weird soundtracks and things to go with the performances. Were you writing your pop songs at that time as well? Was it, was it I think songs it? came out, but I've still got them all on cassettes. It's like I'm doing, I did the first, you know, the five lo-fi albums, which yeah, was just I, on a four yeah. track cassette. I started to do another one. So I Was Born A Man was the first one. So yep. I'm, I'm copying that again, where I give them a card and they vote their, their top three and then it becomes the greatest hits between yeah. the people yeah. on that So um, I can't remember what you asked me now. Where, where, what was it? Um, were you writing pop songs along with? Oh yeah, I think that? songs popped out. <laughs> the little things that you put aside that wouldn't work on a on a soundtrack. But yeah, I, I was, was messing around with backwards voices and stuff, and that was probably David Lynch as well, because you know Twin Peaks is all oh, backwards stuff. We're now yeah. going to talk about this period of time that, in my mind, fairly mythic because I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Between about I would say the early nineties to about ninety four, ninety five. You've su not suddenly, but you've got this huge collection of songs amassing. Is mm. that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. On Porter Studio from Porter Studio recording. Yeah, so it was a Tascam size yeah. size of a suitcase. Um, yeah, and I was um, where, where was it? I, I was in a I was above a taxi for part of it. I was above a so it was it, it was it was people got the impression that it was lo-fi bedroom, and I tried to get rid of that because it was on the kitchen table that I actually did it all in the, in a shared flat with people and having to do it when they were out and yeah. stuff. And Which being on the dole probably helps with it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they'd be working or, or at college or wherever. So, so yeah, so it was, it was just, it, it was good. It was the perfect time to get me through that period because it wasn't a nice period. I mean, being on the dole is not as you were alluding to, you know, yeah. job centers weren't great back then either. No, no, um, you're absolutely right. But it seemed to be, there were ways and means, if, if yeah. you know, uh, to get. Yeah, the and I had no idea what I wanted thing. to do. I was talking to my son now; he has no idea. He's sixteen, but I was, you know, in my early twenties, and I yeah. still had no idea what I really wanted to do. I didn't want to do music. I didn't want to. I was doing the theatre thing, but I don't think I was fully invested in that. But music was never ever an idea until ninety four, ninety five, as a, as a serious jump. But you'd written about four hundred songs by that time. Yeah, but that was just that's. The same now. That's what I do now. I don't do it for anyone else. I do it for myself because I like. I do like singing, 
and I like playing, but but I'm not. I don't have anyone in mind that's, at all, and that's what it's like. Opposite on the to most people who get involved with music or want yeah. to be in a band, isn't it? It's because I, I think probably because I was I, probably because I was a bit older. Because you yeah. know, I was I was kind of approaching my thirties when I when it all started. So you, you're a bit more grounded, I think, yeah. in the fact that I'd been on the dole for five years yeah. and kind of not had any money. Um, Where were you living at this point? Well, I, yeah, I was thinking about, I was living in, a, uh, in Nottingham and it was in a, a massive uh, block of flats above the Broadmarsh shopping centre. Right. And I, I think looking back on it now that I did have some kind of mental, <laughs> mental depression because it was just horrendous. I was in this tiny little box room. That's where I did a lot of my writing. And I was next to a bloke that I found out later was actually beating up his girlfriend. I never heard anything. No. But I found that out later from a friend that, so I thought he was an all right bloke. But he's yeah. like, you know, it's like you meet Ted Bundy and you think he's probably nice yeah. if you met him. But he was that kind of, that kind of like charming bloke, but he was doing this. And this was so. going on around you in yeah, this big no, block of But flats, there's a picture you know? of me going like this and I just look insane. There's one picture of me being in those, in those flats, but... I had no money. My parents didn't help me at all. You know, I didn't ask actually. I never, never wanted to ask them. But I had ten pounds in my, in my bank account, and um, I was fiddling the meter. So I would use a, but I would use a Kirby grip. You know, open, open yeah. the meter, take fifty p out, put it back in, hope the landlord wouldn't see. So, and I had a TV that had green, like you know, proper big TV, yeah. and it had green blobs like a blob machine going over. And I used to watch TV and share a flat, a share a shower with with whoever. No, it's a pretty pretty evil time, but I, yeah. I kind of did so much music. So, and that's if I hadn't, you know, I do believe if it hadn't worked out like that, then I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. So, oh, what, what you've done? Good, I mean, how that, profound! It, really? <laughs> <laughs> it all sounds very pretentious talking about yourself. I'm not used to it, but this it, it, is this gives a I, I, for me uh, loving your music for a long time. Um, it was actually fatherhood. That was played mm. to me by a producer, like yeah. Steve Lovell, who was a big. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was yeah. a big uh, friend of Steve Power? Yeah, I think he worked. With who him, did the he? first album? Right. Yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so, uh, I heard I heard these records, and, and for me, and probably for a lot of other people, you, you seem to come out of nowhere with all these songs. But I know what actually happened was you got a publishing deal with Chrysalis before you got a recording yeah. deal. Is that right? Or did you do it at Ooh. the same time? I think the publishing deal came, yeah, it was a guy called Dave Wibley who worked at Chrysalis. Great name. And he, yeah, he's, he's Liverpool and he's a great, great bloke. I don't know him anymore, but he was, um, yeah, we know, we, 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 I think we signed that just maybe a few months before the band got signed. I Did think, you have a manager or was this you doing? Yeah, I had a manager, work? Dave Taylor, who who's, was my manager for 20 years or so. How did you meet him? Because again, you obviously you had all these songs, you were in Nottingham. How did yeah, you well, that, that ties it with Nottingham? So I thought I was, you know, losing my mind a little bit. And then I would send cassettes to my friend Graham, who, Graham Wrench, who, who manages um, Richard Hawley and, and right. various people. Um, and I was in a band with Graham for a very short period of time. Um, and he, I'd sent him cassettes and he was working at the lead mill in Sheffield. So right. he, he would to have the cassettes, he'd leave them on his desk. People would take them and start listening to them and making copies. So suddenly Graham thought, oh, we might have something here. Stephen's written so many songs. We need to tart them up because they sound terrible on the, on the cassette. Not terrible, but the quality, which has always been my problem. <laughs> the quality, quality. Um, so, so then his friend Dave, they just had a drunken conversation one night and said, why don't, why don't we get Stephen to Sheffield and see what we can do with this? So I moved to Sheffield and then Hunter's Bar, which is really nice part of Sheffield. Um, and it just, it, it, that's, that's where my life changed really, because then I introduced to um, Luke, the guitar player, who's still right. with me and Rob. Um, we just, I think we got very drunk on this called Old Rogers. It's, it's dark. That rum. Oh, it was spelled O. Oh, no, no, it no? was it was it was a bitter. It was O W Ode Ode Roger Ode. or something. But it was so. It was one of those one of those evenings, and we thought we could put a band together and then w rework some of the lo-fi stuff, like our father. Yeah. I think Good Night was on that. Or, yeah, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, rework it, and then that's 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 where it where it happened really. And I think I'd got my publishing deal, like you say, like a few months before, um, and then. Um, yeah, the, the band just, just start. I think I got interest from the lo-fi stuff because in the enemy and stuff, they had a top 10 chart. 
Yeah. So, and it used to go to the top, you know, and people found it fascinating because it was all different types of music on there as well. Baby Bird recordings. So these yeah, Baby Bird yeah, recordings. Yeah, so, yeah. so they suddenly got interest. The record companies heard about this, and um, yeah, I, I, chrono chronologically, I'm not describing that very well because there was a two year period as well before that, before these albums came out, where. Um, Dave and Graham would go down to London and be told to get out of the office. Nick Beggs from Kajikugu said, "You can when he writes a middle eight, you can come back." So very, patr very patronising. And I've actually, I've, <laughs> I've actually got. I know I got my own back on him because he was on Twitter, and I think he apologised. So <laughs> it was quite funny. But he, he was that. Yeah, he after Kajikugu, he became an A and R man for someone, which is what they always do. Really, I think people. <sighs> Failed musicians, possibly. I don't know, but I remember this time too. Obviously, this is all about you, but by being in a band, because people who are watching this won't know that I was in bands too. Yeah. And if we're talking about the period between 1990 and 95, I was religiously going up to London, getting completely screwed over, taking coach loads of friends to the Rock Garden in Oh Cotton God, Garden yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Those old yeah, I remember the Rock Thinking Garden. that we're going to get signed, and of course, the promoter only ever did a phone when we we were totally naive. We're from. Chichester and West Sussex, which is not rock and roll central. So I <laughs> didn't have any idea that people were going to screw us over. We were just going to get signed and yeah. be on top of the pops. And um, I remember the guy said, yeah, 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 you two got signed here and the Smiths. And I was like, OK, we'll come up and play. And it was a difficult time. The start of any decade is kind of mm. like the arse end of the decade before. I remember that the yeah. 90s was a bit like the 80s, really. Yeah. The UB40 was Why still massive. Why is that? That's weird, bands. isn't it? They, 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 it has to make a thing of that. I, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's it's weird, but you know, at that point, world, it was um, what was selling lots. Wet, wet, wet. Mm. Phil Collins was still annoying everybody, mm. and it didn't kind of, really go away, did it? I don't think punk cleared that away. It tried, or, but or acid, it washed yeah. back in again. But yeah. the, the early nineties, because people seem to remember now, Britpop, Oasis, Blur. But that you know that was halfway through that decade, mm. and it was a bit of a wasteland before mm. then. I, I think, and I could see for you. I'm trying to think of bands now that were... Good bands that came out of the early 90s. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, Boo Radleys? The Creation oh, Boo stuff? Yes, there were. And, and the Dodgy, stuff was Dodgy the the, these I forgot these bands were just there, weren't they? Yeah, 90s. Well, yeah. Dodgy, you've, you've played with, haven't you? A fair bit. You did yeah. a tour. Yeah, you done? I'm not yeah. saying anything about that. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, let's, let's talk. You've put the band together. You've moved to Sheffield, which I've only been to a couple of times, but it seems like a really, I really like Sheffield. You get a bit of a buzz as you, as you get to Sheffield. I really like it. I think you're lucky you've only been there two times, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> okay. I loved it. When I moved there, compared to Nottingham, Nottingham is, was very dance, which, which, I, which was fine, yeah. but, but I, I, it was kind of 80s, 80s dance and stuff. Yeah. It, it, was, it was something a bit odd about it, but it was a very clubby scene. Um, so, so yeah, Sheffield just felt like Cabaret Volte, you know, it was a uh, concert angels. It was, it was all a bit, sort of a bit more interesting. Pulp? Were you a fan of Pulp? No, not point? really. I knew about, I knew about Pulp that they, it took 10 years, I think, before they got yeah. anywhere. And they, they did performance art stuff as well, yes, which I right. swear is the same as stuff we did. We had some bags, like, I, I can't, I, I can't stand the bags of, see-through bags of water that were hung from a stage. And I right. can't, I can't remember something to do with it wasn't goldfish, but there was something weird about it anyway. But they did the same thing in a gig, I remember, and I'm, I'm swore that Jarvis or whoever. Do you think it's the same course, maybe? Yeah, but we, we never, we never, I never really spoke to Jarvis maybe once or twice, but we, we were never, even though they were there a lot earlier, I think 10 years before, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, so we were more like long pigs. We would, we would be side to side with the long pigs and stuff. And that's meet, Richard, meet, was obviously before Richard went solo. Yeah, long so meet them. Was and, and he was Crispin, who I, I still think's got fantastic, look, brilliant voice, fantastic. He works at PRS now. And I, yeah, I tried I to tweet him, him the other day. Did you? Yeah, yeah I, I tried to him. tweet him the other yeah. day, but um, yeah. he hasn't got back to us yet, but hopefully he'll watch this. But he's, written, he's written songs for pop, pop acts and stuff. I don't Has know who, who he's written for. Yeah, I think he, a lot of people have done that. And I think Alison, my, my partner, always says, you know, that's what you should have done. I mean, I've done my fair fair bit of writing with a few people, but it's I do find it odd. I do find it odd having to conform yourself to something else. It's something I'm a bit too rigid. Well, that's one of those things about when you when you have a publisher. One of the things you can do is sit in a room with someone you don't know and write songs. Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? That I mean, yes, yeah, so I did that with Ian Brody, and that was like. Um, it, we, we were on a canal boat in London. It was P P 
Pete Townsend's old boat. Oh, right, yeah. And I yeah. remember Ian saying when he took, when he bought it off him, I think he bought it off him, he said um, Townsend took everything out, even the cutlery. He just took every single piece of, of that boat and cleared it out, you know, because he was hoarding it all. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, Ian would just play his guitar and I, I would be expect, I would look at him and come up with ideas and I've never done that before so that was a peculiar one. It, it's kind of doomed to fail in a way I mean maybe yeah. you might get one. No it did we, we we wrote two songs together and one did of the, you? One, yeah Sugar Coated Ice, Iceberg is quite a big money earner for PRS wise so no it was well worth doing that to pay the bills yeah. So you've got this big batch of songs how would you assign them to those four first five albums? How, how, what did you do? Did, did you, you think, mean the lo-fi ones? Yeah, the lo-fi ones. Before we get um, to where you're just about to get signed. Well, they were the best ones, basically. Right. So it's simple as that. Some of them were, were half-baked ideas, some of the 400, which I would have reworked, but 400 is too too many, okay. probably. Um, and a lot of them are soundtracky stuff, and they've come out on Bandcamp in different yeah. guises. So, um, yeah, but things like Goodnight. Go, go, Gorge, Your Gorgeous didn't even make it. It was a demo, 30-minute demo. It made in 30 minutes, basically, really, really quick. In Sheffield, actually, in Fon Records. Um, and it, it, no, no, it didn't, it didn't make it at all. No, it was, uh, it was a song that someone heard and said, oh, we should record, re-record that with Stephen Power, right. Steve Power. And I just, no, I had no, I thought it was a silly song. And I, I didn't realise. <laughs> and I know your favourite version of that actually isn't the, what would be the single yeah. version. There's another version that you We did like a slow, that? sad version. I think it really works yeah. like that. I think it's really, really good. I was trying to find that. Where is it? It's a, it's a B-side on Candy Girl, I think. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll send it to you. I'll find yeah, I've like got to, it. I've I was got looking it up because... No, I'll send it to you. Yeah. I WhatsApped you the other day about your favourite 15 songs, which you oh, came yeah. back with incredibly quickly for a man with yeah. a fair few songs. I think if you think about it too much, you'll, you'll get to it. And it might be different it. today. As well. Yes, it, it probably would be. Today. Yeah. Okay, before we pause for a break, we're just going to talk about the getting the Echo deal. Mm. So Echo Records were part of yeah. BMG. Yeah. There was some interesting artists you had... Julian no, Pope, Echo was wasn't, sorry, no, Echo wasn't, BMG, I think, has become, was, Echo was part of Chrysalis. Right, okay. So BMG is something, is, is, is later. Okay. I mean, sorry to be, yeah. No, 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 it's no, like, no, absolutely. No, because BMG were a German company, and I, I don't think, it was a company that took over stuff, so I didn't really have a relationship with them. I had a relationship with Chrysalis, definitely. Right, and which was, Echo was like the independent side of Chrysalis? Yeah, it was independent, say? but I think it had backing from Pony Canyon, so, which was a Japanese thing. Right. I think when you see the successful indies they normally have a backer i don't yeah. think it's very very hard to um i don't know but well, maybe not beggars banquet and I don't, I don't know if they had you you need someone to fund it a little bit i think the era you're talking about as well even because it's money selling to Sony yeah. at the time wasn't it you, you need 90s. to put you need to i mean it doesn't happen now but you need to put adverts you need to yeah. when, when it was touring you need to put posters out and stuff but which yeah. is gone really as pay a little bands bit. to go on tour yeah yeah beer. pay for interviews which i know was going on so um, so what which was it still like? goes on now, I'm sure. The deal. So you... Oh, it was ridiculous. Was it yeah. arduous or was it like they want to sign you, they've signed you? No, it was, it was, it was insane. Because when that's what we were going back to what we were talking about before, when the band started playing, it was 94, and we did these tiny gigs. We hadn't been signed at that point. Right. But it was then a combination of people, the lo-fi getting into the enemy top 10 charts, and then playing the borderline, I think, in London. And a lot of a lot of people from... There was a buzz about it, you yeah, know, and people, yeah. people would come in and, and watch us. People from Virgin, Paul Kinder, who I still know, wanted to sign us, etc. So it was... We went with Echo, I think, because it was the indie, sort of... Indie, independent sort of yeah. feeling about it. Um, I don't even remember the A&R, man. That's terrible. You should remember but that's that. that's good. It's good you know most <laughs> people have yeah. to call the yeah. A&R, man. We'll call them 100 times. You can't even remember who he was. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's... We, we did have a good relationship with all of them. It was, it was nice, but it was... Yeah, the deal was was stupid. It was three hundred thousand, I think. In um, three hundred thousand, yeah, three hundred thousand was the the deal. In so English you, you pounds, don't in English pounds, whatever that means. We didn't see that, but that was put into doing the band. You yeah, know? and yeah, and again, we talk about that after after we've had a break. But it's it sort of, I, I just think I, I'm very much. I don't really control. I'm quite easily led, so in terms of what they decided to do and which single they chose, I'm glad they did Good Night and then You're Gorgeous, but again, that wasn't my decision, so I'm, I'm glad it happened. 
Because we'll I, I wouldn't be doing it now, but yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the Your Gorgeous Years. Oh, lovely. Yes. <laughs> Hi, so we're back talking to Stephen, a.k.a. Baby Bird, about his life and times in the music industry. <laughs> and we're up to a really important part of the story, uh, the recording of Ugly Beautiful. You've just been signed to Echo Records. Of course, Ugly Beautiful was a big hit, gold-selling album. Mm. And the song You're Gorgeous features heavily on that album. Yeah. So what do you remember of recording that album? Um, I think it was... We'd done a few gigs in Sheffield and it was brilliant. It was like immediate... We'd rehearsed, obviously, but we we just it just felt really really good. So, you you kind of felt like once you'd signed, you were losing a bit of that, but it became something different because you you know you'd have a producer, you'd have record company people. But our record company were really good. They didn't come into the studio with Ugly Beautiful. They didn't come in. We we knew the horror stories that people would come and sit there while you were even doing your vocal takes. Had oh, so we didn't have that. But it was horrendous. Yeah. But we didn't have that. We weren't forced into doing anything. We weren't forced to putting your gorgeous out. But I was coaxed. I think this would be. They'd it, heard that one. It, it was they, a chorus song, so people yeah. didn't listen to the ver- verses, and people yeah. still don't. You know, yeah. people that ring me up and say, "Do you want to come to our wedding with a guitar and fifty quid?" That, that I still was, get things like that. That was a question later on. It was, yeah. "Have you been to any weddings or engagement parties?" No, and just heard because it because you don't. If you're singing, you're gorgeous. Yeah. You don't want that song. It's it's sarcastic and it's also critical. But I would never tell anyone how to interpret it. If they no. like it, they like it. But um, yeah, I think also it's been accused of being misogynistic when I think it's not that a man can be a feminist, but I think it's it's a pro-female song. That was the whole it's point, quite wasn't it? Obviously, yeah. But then About someone taking photographs. I've had people throw that back to me and say, oh, you, you know, they even think that you're the photographer or you're the one putting a woman in this position on a bonnet and all this. It's just incredible how people... Anyway, that's interesting how people interpret it in yeah. so many different ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, yeah, I've n- never been offered any funerals for it, which would be interesting. Do your goddess at a funeral, <laughs> which would be more appropriate maybe. But yeah, so so the whole process was really was really easy. But it was a it was a bit of a mess of an album. I think when we were, when we did the next album, it was like a proper band album where we did all the songs. But the first one, we had some of my demos that were tarted up, so it wasn't fully played by the band. But um, things like Good Night, which was the first single. That was fantastic. That's what started the whole thing off. We were like, we Mark, we did Mark Radcliffe and right, yeah. uh, Mark and Loud and we did Mark Lamar and we did all these things and we were in the studio and it was fantastic and it was a giggle. It was in Manchester. We all felt, you know, it was it, it was all not show busy. It was just nice. And um, before everything kicked off with Your Gorgeous, which became insane, really. So let's, let's talk about that. That's, it's, you, I mean, we're not just talking about the UK. You went a lot of places. It was actually a hit in New Zealand as well. Did you get to go to New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was a big hit though. It's a funny one because I always remember with Edwin Collins, a girl like you was huge everywhere, but your gorgeous didn't. And I think it was, we we actually almost signed to Atlantic. No, we did. We signed to Atlantic in America and they wanted to change Bonnet, which is in the to hood. So they wanted us to change (laughs) words. So I just remember this conversation, this woman who was high up in Atlantic saying, right, we'll make a huge hit out of this, but we'd like to change some words. And you just knew from that point it wasn't going to happen. So we were on Atlantic, this amazing, was Led Zeppelin on Atlantic? It's like this incredible thing. And it's just like, we just, we weren't weren't even asked. We just knew it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly really. Um, So, so yeah, very, 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 very strange, but um, I think you're gorgeous. That that's kind of when we we lost our heads a little bit, and it's sort of, you know, I I was in Manchester and I was getting things hurled at me all the time. Not 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 bad things, but it's like you know, be at petrol station at two in the morning and someone would shout, "Oh, gorgeous man!" Even Noel Gallagher shouted out, "Oh, it's the gorgeous man!" And get all this kind of like, uh, so it was too much. I, I literally couldn't live in Manchester, so we had to move to London, which. Sounds very surreal, but it, it was but constant. Do that. It must have been odd because you'd had all those years of writing all those songs and then mm. suddenly it feels like it was almost an overnight thing. It didn't really make sense. It was an overnight thing. Oh, wow. And I think people referred to on TV the other day as a, you know the, the, the one-hit band Baby Bird, which doesn't happen a lot, actually. I'm quite glad because yeah. you know we had nine, nine other singles, top 40. But I, I don't, it's a water off a duck's back. I don't, I don't really care anymore. I just think Your Gorgeous was really important now because... It, it made enough money for me to carry on doing yeah. exactly what yeah. I want to do. So, how so. was being on top of the pops of the Spice Girls? 
They came into our dressing room. Did they? Yeah, fantastic. We'll never forget it. Alison, who's, who's my, my girlfriend, she, she was there as well. And it was before our kids were born, actually. They would have loved it as well because they know who the Spice Girls are. Yeah. No, they came in like a, a whirlwind and they were fantastic. All of them, all five of them came in. Mel really? B was very kind of like in your face. Did yeah. you like Britpop? Was there any parts of chart music around that time you liked? Um, I liked Blur and I liked... I like Oasis. I still still like Oasis. I think Oasis, you know, do you know what I mean? It's a fantastic six, six, is it six minutes? Brilliant song. Um, yeah, but all, we never were because we had a hit. I really think a lot of Britpop bands had hits, but I think we had that hit that was maybe seen as a novelty song. Right. So that right. kind of made, I don't think that, that you know. That's quite, been frustrating for you. That must have been. Yeah, but I didn't want to be part of a movement. It was a media movement. Right. It wasn't right. anything to do with Blur and Oasis. They just did that for a news story, didn't they? So, yeah. no, I'm kind of, I'm kind of like glad that we weren't roped into that. But also if you've, you're seen as a, a top 40 pop band, which we never were, but that's because people are lazy, you know, if you dig in and have a look, it's clearly not. But we're still known for that song. Yeah. You know, people yeah. won't know anything else. It still gets played a lot, I imagine. I mean, yeah, I yeah, yeah. If I tune yeah. into the radio, more often than yeah. not, it'll come. It'll come no, it's brilliant. It, yeah. is, it is brilliant because you do hear it, you know. You see Prince William DJing. He, he was in Africa or somewhere playing "You're Gorgeous," and he was doing this stuff with him. Yes, yeah, yeah, great. Some great moves. Yeah, you know, where you wrote it? Because you said it. I know you, we talked earlier was, on about how you yeah. remember it, but where were you? In, in... It was in Sheffield. My my, who we were talking about before, Dave Taylor ran a studio where Bjork recorded her first album, um, "Age of Champs." I don't know if they they had like Kiss, a label. They did that. Amazing kiss, kiss, that's right. A rock type it, of kiss it's called Fon, so it was Fuck Off Nazis, which is what Fon meant. And it was a, a studio and it was next to Phil Oakey's studio. Right. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I was just on a, it was a reel to reel again, coming back to reel to reels, but it was like, uh, we just did it in like a, it's a, it's, it's, it's like all my stuff is lullabies. So it's like, you know, you could be doing it like that with two fingers. Really simple stuff. So Your Gorgeous was just done in 30 minutes and put away with all the other 400. And we have no so, idea what was going to happen. No, no idea. I thought it was a bit, probably a bit daft, really. You know, you can read that back, especially yeah. the verses. <laughs> you know, it's like, some of it's a bit cringy, some of it's interesting. But yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's funny what people like. They never yeah. like the stuff you like very often, which is, Music which is like good. It never works out the way you think it's yeah. going to. You might which is have interesting, though, yeah, isn't it? It, it makes it interesting. It's kind of something intangible yeah. you can't quite grasp, but... Yeah. It kind of works in ways you don't think. Let's talk about, so obviously you behave very badly, like everybody else in that time. Um, did I behave badly? Yes, I suppose so. I mean, I was, I was approaching 30, so I'd, I'd never, you know, I was, I was going to bands when I was 15, 16, drinking too much. But um, yeah, I don't know what you mean by behaving badly. I wasn't sleeping. The rock and roll lifestyle. I wasn't sleeping. You've gone from the room. bedroom in Nottingham to suddenly having a top yeah, three I hit. And I, I think we, we, never, we never toured. I think when you tour for months on end, I think that's when the bad habits can crawl. Right. But we've never done tours more than three weeks. So right. I don't think it was ever like that. I think I would have to say, I'm not delving into that too much, but I think the <laughs> fact that I was approaching 30 yeah. is like, you know, you're a bit more sensible. You're not, if, if I was 17, 18, then I'm hell, hell would have broken. Different. So after this, um, the next album, you get to record, I noticed, um, on the Spanish coast. So yeah. your recording experiences yeah. are now becoming quite yeah. plush. Oh, fantastic. Started, so. It probably wasn't that expensive, though. It was a, an old guy who was in a band called The Peddlers. He was um, a raster, an old raster guy. Yeah. Who, he wasn't old then, but he's old now. But um, he, he used to, they used to put the Stones and the Beatles and stuff, and they were the, the peddlers. I don't know where it came from. But anyway, he had a studio out there next to Iron Maiden, had a studio next to it, which we never Brilliant. went. Um, yeah, and it was, a, uh, where was it? It was Il Cortigio, and it was near Porto Banus. So we had lots of fun taking pictures of Banus in front of the beat. So it's an anus. That's the, those are my memories. Terrible. Um, juvenile uh but it but you could you were in the vocal booth and you were looking over to africa and it was just re really really nice and, and you produced someone didn't you was that, did you produce that one or did you do it with yeah no anybody? we did it with a guy called matt hay who, right. who's worked with the who actually who does live shows with the who he was a young kid then and he was like um he, he was in the band as well for a, and his girlfriend um 
Yeah, it was really good because we, even though some of the songs were from the lo-fi, yeah, we we used lo-fi from from lo-fi period. We used a lot of those. It was it was a band, so we'd go in, we'd do the drums, we'd yeah. do everything, which Oggy Beautiful didn't do. It was like a bit of a mess, and it was just it's, it's, it's definitely a better album than Oggy Beautiful if um, there's something going on. Yeah, is, Peter yeah. and the song itself yeah. is gorgeous. One yeah. of my favourites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that song. Yeah, right at the end of the album, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's yeah, yeah. Just beautiful. No, it was used and Vic and Bob used it. Because obviously Bob's a big fan. Yeah, there's a very weird scene where Matt Lucas is on the top of a car making eggs come out of his mouth and they use, and they that, use that music. to find that. So. Um, a little bit about Echo at the time because Julian Cope was signed, Feeder, Maloko. Do you have anything to do with anybody at the time? No, I think Mark Armand eventually as well, but right. no. Um, no, didn't meet Julian Cope. Maloko Rasheen, we knew Rasheen because right. she was at Fon at Sheffield, the record company. Of course, yeah. Sheffield, so yeah. yeah. And obviously Sing It Back was the same... Sort of time as yeah. gorgeous, so yeah, but yeah, no, no, no real interaction. I think it was more with the long pigs and and who else? And yeah, probably the long pigs actually. We used to spend a lot of little Sheffield festivals and stuff, it was great. Long pigs, that first album yeah. is fantastic, isn't it? Well, right, out, yeah, no, it's it is brilliant. And Jesus yeah. Christ is, I just think, fantastic. And she said, and yeah, yeah, no, I, I still listen to that in the gym. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. Brilliant. Still have my play. Again, it's a Crispin's voice is pretty damn good. It's as well, brilliant. Isn't it? He's yeah, got brilliant. that kind of ravaged voice. That... I th well, I think it's the key, the key is not to use dated instruments. A lot of 80s stuff where they use Lynn drums or they use, you know, certain sounds. It's, it dates it. Yeah. But I, yeah. I hopefully, even with Your Gorgeous, I think you can't pick to it. It's, it's a nat natural sounding guitar yeah. bass. There's nothing on there that's going to make you think it's... From a different period, and same with the long pigs. It feels nowish, so yeah. Even though indie music is on its knees a little bit, let's move on. Yes. Let's talk about bugged, which I think kind of gets overlooked a lot. Oh, that's I think it's that's my favourite. Out of is yeah, it? that's definitely my favourite. That was with Matt again, who produced it, and Luke, who's a guitar player. Um, Luke Scott. Um, yeah, that was done in. Um, we were sharing a studio with Placebo were next door. Um, and, and we got on with them really well. They were really nice. Um, but, but it was in London, in, um, I can't remember where it was now, Little little, some, little Russell Street. So it was okay, an, yeah, it was yeah. an underground thing. It was really cosy. It was like damp. It was a Matrix and, studio. It, no, it wasn't Matrix. It was a Matrix studio. I think it was. There's a Matrix studio, right. different places. I think right, it was okay. Matrix. Right, yeah, okay. it was Matrix. Yeah, that rings a bell, Little Russell Street. Near, 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 near Holborn and... Right. That, that kind of yeah, a, that yeah. piece. It sounds, it sounds right. But yeah, it was just again, really, really. It was just me, Luke, and Matt. So it was, it was really simple. We'd gone back to just simple stuff, and and the songs on there just hang together. Really yeah, it's well. a great album, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I think that's no, fantastic. Really and the F word was was from that. And Gordon Ramsay picks it up. Picks it up. Did he pick it up at the time, or was it a bit afterwards? Um, for the TV it was, show. Yeah, it was just a little bit afterwards, but that again, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just great for your PRS and keeps you going. You, you need to have, that's the thing you see a lot of people don't, are not lucky enough. We're so lucky that we've had those different songs. A couple of songs. That you, just... can't, you can't fund yourself without that. No, so. no. And um, well, F, -word, F Word's a great song, and of course, I think Gordon Ramsay had a few series, didn't it? Was, uh... It was 13, I think, and one in America, but it didn't go. I was thinking. My PRS suddenly shot up one month and it was like, oh, and then they, they're not doing another one. Uh, but yeah, it's ridiculous. F word, food word, he swears. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. Good ridiculous song, how though. these things happen. Good song. Yeah, yeah. Good song. But it's, that's the strange thing. We, we were offered Veep, which is a, 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 a woman, a, for a woman to, a, a waxing thing. <laughs> and we were offered £400,000 for that. And we were up against two other people. We were down to the wire to get to, to use your gorgeous for worldwide use, and that didn't happen. So that's that's how weird v, it is. You went wrong. <laughs> no, but with the F word, it's like yeah. um, it's 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 funny how what a fine line it is between yeah. you you doing something and not. Yeah, it's almost like this big league, isn't it? It's like you it's get just a glimpse stupid of this money. It's huge. Stu no, it's just stupid. industry it's that just goes stupid. on behind. Yeah. Okay. Um, did Echo drop you nicely? Did you just think I've had enough and want to walk away? Or what? yeah, I think with our fourth was it our fourth single, Corner Shop, which we call Corner Flop, of course, which was Obviously. went into the top forty, thirty eight, yeah. but that was the beginning of the end, really. And I think we we kind of then bugged the F word. We had a guy called Scott Peering who was brilliant. Yeah. He was absolutely amazing bloke. He was a great PR guy, wasn't oh, he? Oh, he's yeah. incredible. Sadly, no longer with us. Yeah, but no, well, yeah. we we got to know him really well, and we went out went out socially with him. But he died around F word time, so right. 
And he was just a total maverick. He knew John Peel. He would turn up with our albums and he, he just had the sleeve. He'd forgotten to put the album <laughs> in it and play. So he was like that. It was very ditzy, but he was like, that was, that was where, I think that's where things began to, 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 to kind of like go south a little bit. But it was like, it, would, it should have finished anyway earlier. I think it Were you relieved to be off a major? At that point, knowing that where you where you'd started, where you'd it's come just, from, it's just weird. It's just you know you have to think about um, to, you know to be coming to the age I am and to be to, to, to still be able to fund what I'm doing. You, you've got to you can't just be you know dancing around thinking I'm making music. You've got to think about it in terms of providing for your family. <laughs> Unfortunately, being sensible. So, and I'm guessing in the early 2000s, I think that you was were back getting closer to having a family at that point. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's it was it's got to be in your mind that uh, you've got to make money somehow. And but things have always come along. Things have always mm. come along at the right time, you know, in terms of like doing press stuff. And there's always something new to talk about. It doesn't have to go back to your gorgeous, which it very often does on local radio. Yeah. <laughs> So the period 2000 to 2006, um, it might be seen as a quieter time for you because you're not on yeah. the bigger label, but you were doing things like writing the books. Mm. You did, uh, I mean, how, how was writing a book in comparison to writing a song? Did you like the solitude of it? Because obviously you've got to no. be, no, you didn't like it. No? <laughs> <laughs> it drove you a bit mad. I've always, I've always had ideas. So I, I used to write shit poetry as I was saying to you off camera I think and, and I've always written stuff down but lyrics are perfect because it's one piece of A4 and yeah. it's that's the way I prefer to even that's quite hard work that's the hard work writing the music I don't find difficult but the lyrics the lyrics yeah. are difficult so no that was just that's a discipline I'm not disciplined even though I write a lot of music I don't find that a discipline because I enjoy it so it's not a discipline it's your hobby in a way, but yeah. with, with writing, I had to sit down and write it. And you could correct over and over. Yeah, and over. I could still go. Yeah. I'd probably correct every sentence in there if I went back and read yeah. it. So, but it was something. If you're, if you're, you know, having your first, we had a flexi disc and we had a single, and then we had a, a something on a, a twelve inch, and then a CD, and all these different things, picture discs. Yeah, it's like why wouldn't you want to do it? And I thought, right, I, I, I want to do. It would be fantastic to have a book. Yeah. And it's it, everything small scale. I never do anything for money. I don't think I got. I think I got a check for thirty seven p was my first royalty check on that. That was actually before it came out. But I had to do book readings and stuff, and I hated that. I just go bright red. I found it very embarrassing. So the whole process of it's very different from getting up on stage with lights on your face. I did. I didn't really enjoy enjoy the process. But I'm just so glad I did it. I got yeah. the chance. To, well, they're there, aren't they? They exist. It's just yeah. Fantastic, my mom. My know? mom has always had a novel in her, and she's she wanted to write a book. You know, like I'm yeah. sure a lot of people do. So to have that 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 thing is just incredibly lucky. Did so she read yours? I have no idea, actually. I have no idea. I think she will have done. Yeah, but it's such a long time ago. I don't know. We might have had a discussion about it. Let's talk about doing the soundtrack to Blessed. So you, mm. you're writing books, but you're also mm. starting to do soundtracks. And I know you have a big love of instrumental music through the Black Reindeer project that you do, yep. again, on Bandcamp. What was that like, working to, I'm guessing you had stills and shots that you were writing to? Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. It was with the guy called Simon Fellows who had done, he, he didn't, he'd done the, what the Wesley Snipes films. He did Blade or something. Right, he okay. Did. So yeah. he, he, was a good, he was a good filmmaker. Um, um, yeah, it was a case of all you have to do with soundtracks is you have to cut it down to the second, which I've never done. So it's, again, it's a disciplined thing like writing a book. You've just got to... They'll come back and they'll say, right, can you make it sound a bit like this? Can yeah. you make it sound like something off The Omen or The Exorcist? Or can you do this or do that? Which I do find quite hard work because I don't like to copy stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it also pushes you in, in good direction, directions. So. Yeah. But then they'll say, oh, it's five seconds too short. And you're thinking, shit, I haven't. Just put some reverb on it. But something. I don't have the equipment to do that. It's, right, it's like, okay. I don't, I'd, I'd go back and I would try and I just, I just, it was something I couldn't do very well. But anyway, it worked out really well. It had, um, Andy Circus in it. Oh right, yeah. You know Andy Circus, he's, he's actor, he? yeah, who I've does seen him in a bunch King of stuff. Kong and good. he does all the key, the CGI stuff and Heather Graham and but the, again that was fascinating. I'd be in the I think there was a guy, the producer was was in the room and he'd done Tron. Do you remember Tron? Yeah, the, the kind yeah, of green yeah. with uh, Jeff Jeff Bridges. Was Crazy it? sort of sci fi with loads yeah, of Yeah, um, it was it was seen as very it, yeah. it was seen as very, you know, new at the time. 
Anyway, we were in the mixing thing and, and he was telling me to cut the music, the Simon was telling me to cut the music down, but the producer was there, he's this old American guy from LA or something, and we were looking at this one clip and it was a picture of Heather Graham trying to escape and it was her backside, basically. <laughs> and there was another scene of a car going like that and he said, can you cut a few seconds off that car going into the river? It kind of shoots off into the river and put a bit more of Heather's ass in it. So because he was producing it, that's what that's happened. That's what happened. And, and that affected the music. <laughs> <to put up. laughs> so that, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of way these movies are made. It's like, let's, let's yeah. put more of a, Easy more backside, less more car. Backside, yeah. yeah. Um, 2003 saw um, the Almost Cured of Sadness album, which came out under the Stephen mm. Jones name. Mm. Why use your own name for that record? Just to take it from Baby Bird. Right. Just to... I think I think that that is. I'm trying to think of my favourite album. I mean, I, like you took Bugged is is great band album maybe, but that is the most unique to me. I think it's got sadness. Yes, sadness. Yeah, it's even a even a remix. No, a, a, that's that's a cover version of Singer Rainbow. So I put that in there, but it's just it's just the sounds. It just again like the King of Nothing stuff. King of Nothing still probably my favourite proper song album. But yeah, this weird hip hop -y stuff and yeah I, I, I thought it, it those beats were showing through a little bit more on, on that record and your yeah. love of hip hop so yeah. who are your favourite sort of hip hop artists ooh a lot of early stuff uh, Eric B and Rakim yeah um, early Public Enemy so not the first album I like the second album Burn, Burn Hollywood Burn and, and Fight the Power which again the Spike Lee film again is just fantastic um, who else it's like um Oh, Tribe Called Quest. Yeah. Um, for the Far Side. Bands like that was just... Um, the Bizarre Eric, Ride album's amazing. That yeah, oh God, album. fantastic. But Eric B and Rakim is just um, it, it's for amazing stuff. Just his voice is beautiful. You talk about baritone voice, but what a voice he's got. It's incredible. Oh, and no, Gangstar as well. Yeah. Um, Love, yeah. Love Sick, I, I love that song. But very, very poppy, but it's great. And I still, I still do that now. I still listen to Travis Scott and... But it's all very vocoded. Mm. A lot of Drake stuff is is the vocoder voice, and it'd be nice to <laughs> have some old school hip hop. Have his voice yeah. back, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk about. I've got here is Johnny Depp and the Unison years. How the hell did you two meet? What happened there? Um, he apparently, I don't, uh, this is before I met him, but him and Marilyn Manson, you know, Marilyn, Obviously, Marilyn's you know, been in the, the press. The duo you'd expect to go been together, in the, yeah. The, yeah, he's been in the news as well, hasn't he, for whatever reason. Um, no, they were sat around listening to uh, Take Me Back, which was filmed in, which was made, Luke played the piano for that. That was in Il Cortijo in the Spanish studio. So that's where that, it's a nice story, that's where it happened. But he was listening to that and Bad Old Man, yep. which again is probably, a, I didn't even put that on the top 15. No, list, but, it's a great one. But um, uh, apparently they were sitting around together and they just said, you know, Marilyn said to, to no, Johnny said to Marilyn, you have to sign this bloke. Because I, I don't know if Marilyn had a, he could get me a deal or something. But anyway, that didn't happen. But that's where Johnny wanted to meet me. So he was, he was filming Finding Neverland. Right. So yeah. I, I was, I had no idea of Hollywood people, but I was living in Pembrokeshire at the time, seven hours away, and I thought I'd get a helicopter, and I didn't. I had to get on the train. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking, I don't, I don't need to spend that, but I got on the train. So it was a seven hour journey, I think, altogether. And then I, I walked through this massive kind of corridor, and he was under a desk, fixing a speaker with his Frank Keenan. And so I saw his ass. They were talking about asses again. I said, that's why I, I saw Johnny Depp in his jeans, which I'll never forget. With Unison, which is an American label. Yes, it was um, Johnny's friend, Bruce. Yep. So that, he hooked me up with him and we, I went to Bruce's studio in LA and um, did two albums with him. So, yeah. And this follows um, Between My Ears, There's Nothing But Music. Which was a great. Yes, another, another, album. yeah, good yeah, songs really, on there. Yeah, really some good, good stuff album. on there. A fantastic album, mm. which you didn't tour, but you toured around two thousand. It was a disaster. Right? It was when I was kind of falling out with my manager, and it was kind of chrysalis. Put a load of money in, no, not a load, but put some money in, and it just didn't, didn't, didn't click. Work. And we didn't have Scott Peering, so we didn't have any PR behind it. And it was just, I thought it was a really good song, but it took a long, long time to do. And yeah. it was just, it was fin it's like the F word, it took ages. It was like a pro tool thing where you had to like, it just became one of those songs. You yeah. Get those songs which take days and it was a bit, the whole album took days. So, so we, yeah, we leapt, leapt over that album, even though I still listen to it, you know. It's I, I, I think it's a great album. Yeah. Um, 
viewers won't know, but um, I actually put Steve Non as Baby Bird around this time, and I'm guessing it was yeah, we took around that. this time. Yes. Yeah. As a promoter, I promoted over a thousand gigs in Brighton. You know, I did it for 12, 14 years or something stupid. But I always remember the night of putting you on because it was the only time where the following day I received a letter from two people who had come to the gig and watched it and then complained about it via a letter, which they dropped <laughs> off at the venue. Brilliant. Fantastic. And you I, still got that letter? No, I, I haven't. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you if I had it. I'd give them their money back. They saw the whole yeah. gig. They got annoyed at something you said. I don't know if it was Cliff Richard or God. I cannot remember now, but it yeah. could be either, couldn't it? Or both, maybe. Yeah. You know. I performed on the same day as Cliff Richard. We, we did, we were signed at EMI when we shouldn't have been signed. The, the, the guy got sacked after this. He gave us money and got me to do a conference and it was just me. And I made some really daft comment. But anyway, I was in between Eternal and Cliff Richard. And I just remember Cliff Richard saying, everyone had to turn, had to put the cigarette, because you could smoke indoors then, I think. Yeah, I think. days. And he, everyone had to stop smoking so Cliff could walk through the room. And you just did a song, that was it. And it was an EMI conference, but we were, we were on EMI, but we weren't supposed to be. It's very weird. Very In Dublin, this is. It's very bizarre. Wow. Anyway, another story. Crazy music, yeah, music industry. Crazy. So, X-Maniac and Pleasures of Self-Destruction, 2010, 2011. Yeah. Memories of those. Um, yeah, being in Bruce's outhouse. I remember I was... This is in the States. Was, yeah, this is in yeah. LA, in his house. He had a studio, and I was in this like place, and I just remember lots of crickets bouncing around <laughs> when I was trying to sleep. <laughs> It was like, uh, it wasn't as I expected, you know, because it was a depth connection. I thought, yeah. oh, it might be a bit, a bit posh this, but it wasn't. It was just, it was very nice. It was like I knew. It was like going to Matrix Studio and, and his studio was really nice. And I got on with Bruce straight away. And um, yeah, and then we did, did the album. It's very different because it's very polished. And, and Bruce had worked with Johnny on um, Sweeney Todd. So he, this is the first time Johnny ever sung, basically. He, he, he was, he was, he's very shy. So, yeah. he, so anyway, Bruce got um, Johnny to sing and it was in that studio that we did it. That was a few months or so before, I think, or, or after, I can't remember. But anyway, so it was, it was, it was just a really, really nice kind of place to be. And I know Johnny likes it there as well, because there's no airs and graces. It's just right. very basic, yeah. not a huge mixing desk, just quite, a, yeah. you know, nice place. Stephen, let's talk about, we've talked about Johnny Depp. Let's talk about the experience of making a video mm -hmm. with the man and you've got to now bring out your acting chops as well how did you feel about making a video with him at the other end of the camera um well yes <laughs> you know i, I it's a bizarre thing because i was on holiday somewhere and he phoned me up and had this idea for someone an 18th century soldier basically and so i wasn't going to say no that wouldn't be my immediate jumping point but then he showed me it was an ambrose bierce Ambrose Pierce or Pierce, I can't remember, told me it was a story and he said, you know, look at this story. So I did and it looked interesting. The thing with the video is there's no way it was ever going to really help my career because uh, Yahoo and various people wouldn't play it because it's, you know, there's death in it. There's, yeah. there's someone being, even though, even though I saw recently Lady Gaga had a thing where her legs are dangling. So if you're really famous you can be hung on <laughs> on, a, on a video, but we couldn't. And maybe it, the it hanging laws have changed since, uh, what year was it? Yeah, one? maybe, uh, 2001-ish, no, no, 2010, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so no, so so it, it was never gonna be something that was gonna really, it was a fantastic thing to do, but it's too dark really for, for it to be a promotional yeah. tool. Well, it's um, great at the end when you, no, you make this movement, which yeah. is, you no, it's great. jerk back, don't was you? A, and it's like, oh, no, God. no, no, no. It's a great, it's a great idea. Yeah. And you know, there was a I had a stunt double, and it was like, like you say, Stephen Graham was in it, and Angus um, Barnett was in it. He's, he's been in Pirates and stuff. But it was, it was all about the, the things I remember are the wetsuit I had to wear, which was like a, it was like a because I dropped drop in the water. Yes, it was yeah. like this this pale brown thing, and it had a tiny little hole so you could go to the toilet. And, then, <laughs> and the whole thing was unglamorous because I, I was, I had to do my hair in a certain way. My hair is appalling and it. it's like a flock of seagulls. And it's like Alison, my partner again, just, we just laugh so much about how, how could you be in this video that cost a fortune how was and the look like I did? Yeah, I, mean, I didn't, I didn't lose weight. I was a bit, I had to wear a th th big thing and I was like, I looked a bit portly and it was just, it's just not a music video really it was a small film which was great yeah, yeah. 
And, you know, who gets the chance to do that? It was just a, a complete freak, freak thing. Freak that moment. Was, no, amazing. So you have your own trailer and, you know, that's never going to happen. G-spot? Somewhere. There's but rumors it, you had a yeah, there was one, a yeah? yeah, which apparently a lot of people on the on the crew were were saying, you know, we never get this. Live in the high life. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. I remember my kids were really young, and I've got loads of pictures of my kids. And the the catering bus was a big blue bus, and there's pictures of the kids wanting to drive the bus and stuff. So it was. It, I just remember it from 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 them really. Not the first time my daughter met Johnny, and that's a pretty cool thing, times. isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, your dad yeah. saying, "There's Johnny over there. I'm just gonna." Yeah, get killed or that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's, just, it's just no, it's just brilliant for brilliant for them, really. You know, they 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 got to meet him. So after this, from about two thousand thirteen onwards, Bandcamp becomes quite big in your life. How yeah. did you discover Bandcamp? Um, I, I have no idea. I think I will have been uh, just recommended it. I think. Yeah. Just. Um, because no, it's very quick. Really boring it? answer, but no, no, there is, there is nothing. I just think it's one of those things like you, you would, you know, you'd be googling CD manufacturers. It was a bit like that. Yeah, it popped up and someone told me about it. But it strikes me that it's a really good platform for you because it's very quick, isn't it? You can put a sleeve up there. You've got your music. Bang. I know, it's stupid. It, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of just it it's, exists at that point. It's a record company though. They, you know, they take their cut, which is fair enough. Yeah. Um, but it's it's it reminding me of the DIYness of of doing, you know punk flexi discs and, and all that and designing your own sleeves so I've just yeah. gone back I've gone back to that full circle back to that and it's really hard work actually because it's just it's just kind of me yeah. doing this and you know the, the the nicer you design the sleeves and stuff you know you can you can people will pay more for it so it's 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 worth doing <laughs> so this is easy yeah it's like you said it's easy it's easy and that's why I've always liked it's there's no messing around you don't have to go via anyone it's yeah. a, a faceless yes. organiser. You can speak to them, but it's pretty faceless, so you just go in and do it. But it strikes me that this is something that you're most comfortable with. You, you've done, you've mm. experienced the whole industry, you've been a writer, yeah. you've done lots of different things, and it just feels like for where you are now, you've you've got the perfect outlet for, for, for what you're doing. I mean, I know it's, maybe financially you're not it's getting all, advances. No, things, it, it, no, it's always going to be frustrating that I, I, I'm not talking financially, genuinely not talking financially, but more more people should hear it. That's what every I'm sure everyone that makes music yeah. or everyone that yeah. writes, yeah. they would like more people to hear it. So, but um, you know, it is what it is. So it's oh god, that's a bloody quote from Love Island, isn't it? I keep saying it's what it is, and I've now said it. So let's just fast forward. Uh, we've gone through the unison years. In 2018, you suffered a heart attack, which not a lot of people I know did. about. But um, yeah. talk to us briefly. I know it's not the nicest. It, it wasn't. About. I think people think a heart attack is like grab your left arm and fall on the floor. Yeah. But it, it wasn't. Yeah. It was building up. So it was like uh, you're, you're in, what was the Leonardo DiCaprio thing? The, the man in the iron, where he's in an iron suit. So you feel like that, basically. You feel like you can't move. I was in Stockport, of right. all <laughs> places. And I, I parked up. My daughter was doing her, her GCSEs and I was taking her pretending that I just had a limp, but really I was in pain all over the yeah. place. This is for a month before the signs are always there. So I was in Stockport and I tried to walk a hundred yards from the car and I couldn't. So I tried to get back and it was like watching probably a drunk man basically trying to get yeah. back to the car. And then I knew I had to go and do something about it. And um, yeah, no, no, it was quick. I was in, it was, I've had two, two disaster me medical things. I had many ears, which is an ear thing, which does an imbalance thing, which right, apparently yeah. Van Gogh might have had and cut his ear off, was apart from him being insane, <laughs> that might have been driving him nuts. So that happened on 9-11. So I was diagnosed with that when the planes were going into the build, into oh. the second building, we were in the taxi, second building, we were watching on TVs in, in, in shops yeah. and stuff, yeah. this going on. And then Grenfell, I had my sack on exactly same the same day. Wow. So, so only, a, only a week ago, was it? No, the 14th. So it's my fifth, my fifth anniversary, fifth year. But yeah, they just stick something in three years. I think a lot of people, of, our, of men particularly, of, of our age, don't want to talk to me about it. I yeah. know you're doing an interview now, yeah, but, but I think it scares the life out of people. But you could have it up the groin, which thank God I didn't. I had it in the arm. They force it up the arm and into your heart, and it's just it's a, it's like it's like having your nails done. It's it's that that's how they see it. Right. It's a very simple thing. So you have these stents put in, which are little balloons, and they just. I'm apparently, according to my my doctor, I'm better than I was before. So great, and it's, it's simple. Simple. Don't don't sit at your desk too long. Maybe maybe don't drink so much. 
but don't don't always get up 20. So I have a watch that tells me to get up every 20 minutes, but Is it? I think it's being still and then going to the gym, doing exercise. You've got no choice if you've had what I've had, so. Did it take long to recuperate? Were you actually out of I was too depressed for a year. I think I just drank water and the odd bit of food, but I was incredibly thin, which was the positive. It's a great way to diet. Have a, like yeah. a minor heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> like, Nearly died. It's a great, you're, yeah. You're so you're just water. lying in bed, having, you're lying in bed and you're drinking basically water. So yeah. it was, but I was just de totally depressed. And I, I got to know, name dropping again, but Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer, they both had a similar thing. So I, they came to see a gig, the, the, the first one we did six months after my heart attack. And so Paul has really got me through the whole thing. He, he WhatsApps me every week or so and says, are you still going to the gym? Do it, do it, do it. So uh, that's, no one else wanted to talk about it, but because they'd been in the situation, he's got stents as well. Right. For some reason, you know, he's been- Yeah, it's he's, important he's, because he's it, he might not have had someone, so to be able to help you. No, it's really good, but your, fr your, friends don't, your friends don't want to talk about it, your close friends particularly, because yeah. it scares the life out of them, yeah. unless they've had the same thing. Let's talk a little bit about you working with us at Naked. Yes. I contacted you last year, and we, we, we discussed the idea of eco-vinyl. Did you know anything about eco-vinyl at the time? No, no. no. No, uh, no idea. And I, like I was saying earlier, no idea about landfill. And I just thought they would end up in someone's garage or in a yeah. Oxfam, like I was saying. But it's, yeah, no, that, that, it seems really obvious. But I also thought that you got something here and you were very cool about it, obviously, because you know a lot more about it. It seems like it could be a big, big thing. I, I Whether think, I'm involved or not, that's what well, I would I mean, say to you. I don't want to talk out of place, but there are other records that we have discussed today that we would love to do if yes, we get the chance course. to as we move Absolutely. forward. Yeah. Starting with King of Nothing, for us, worked really well because it hadn't been on vinyl before, obviously. Such a fantastic record. Anyway, you, you were really up for it as well, which was fantastic. That You were really behind us from day one. And I, I, I think... Yeah, you, you, why wouldn't I be? <laughs> it seemed like well, a very obvious... Thing, really but other make... things creep in with bands sometimes they start to worry that you're going to run away with the rights to their music or something like this or or do something with no, it I, ge I, genu it I genuinely have never done anything for music uh, for for money there has been i don't, I don't mean with, with us but in terms of like wanting this i would like more people to hear it yeah and yeah. genuinely but but that doesn't come into my head it never has done if we've got a record deal with echo or whatever it's not really something that computes with me as long as i i, I can live and i can pay my bills yeah. it's a bit like bank camp you're not on bank camp if you want to make a fortune because no. it's quite limited in a way so so yeah no just I'm, I'm just open i knew that wouldn't make it i knew the books wouldn't make a lot of money but yeah. i just if it's something i'm interested in i want to do it you know well it's great well, what we hope from bringing this to the music industry because we are the first eco record club in the world mm. there are a lot of developments now mm. quite exciting ones that behind the scenes mainly at the moment but the record company's already signed up to doing more but they're not so we're the first i'm sure there'll be others who go this way as well there are other people obviously who do use the same pressing plant as us which is deep yeah. groups out in the netherlands mm. i know ninja tune have got a fair bit of their catalog made there over the years so they don't talk about it a great deal but what we hope is over the next year or two that this is going to really kick on and that people will think naked and we work with other artists off the back of the fact that people want to stop using toxic vinyl because there's a lot of well, again that was a surprise there. to me i didn't know that until <laughs> yeah we, well, we were talking earlier you said that you didn't know and i think it's because vinyl has been made in the same way since about the 1940s because you know it's mm. shellac at first that really heavy brick yeah stuff. shellac yeah which is art deco-y is that what a lot of Art Deco stuff was used? No, no it might have been. Rachel, shellac. I'm looking at Rachel yeah. off camera here, but she might know. But shellac actually was... Rachel, what, what is shellac again? Explain. It comes from a beetle. It comes from a beetle. Oh, shell. And they started to use too much of it in vinyl yeah, production, so there wasn't much too. left. So they had to find something else that couldn't use shellac anymore because the Beatles couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. Not the band. The, the Beatles, <laughs> yeah. the pre-Beatles, and um, well, yeah, even, so even M and M's are made out. The blue M and M's are made out of the shell of a beetle, aren't they? I read that somewhere. Yeah. I just thought it was a sales. Thing. Yeah, maybe. Weird one, but. So let's wrap this up. The album will be out in a couple of weeks' time. So it does make a great deal of sense. Somebody's watching this in six months, time. <laughs> but hopefully, we're hoping that we can get you over to France at some point yes, with I'd the band to. Yeah. Um, to do one of our naked uh, vineyard events which we're hoping to do whether it's this year or next year and as i said earlier we hope we can work with you again but i'd just like to say Stephen, from 
Rachel and myself at Naked, we were so, so chuffed that you are our first release. I, I, I've been a massive fan for a very long time of your music, as you know. And it's a real honour for us. So thank you. Yeah, it's an honour for me. So no, it's amazing. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah. let's, uh, yeah, let's hope it's a start of something. We, we can do many other records together because there's yeah. such a lot. Your catalogue is not on vinyl. It's true. And, uh, we yes. can go there. So we'll go to our last section, but we'll we'll, we'll say goodbye to the uh, to the venue. And um, thank you for watching. Yeah, thank you. I'll do that as well. You join us in the, gar the garden of the uh, Cheshire Tap. We are still with Stephen from Baby Bird. He hasn't been able to uh, leg it off yet. And this leg is the part off. of the uh, Naked interview uh, where we ask a series of questions that all our artists will be answering. We call it the Naked Confessional. Uh, it's adapted from the Bernard Pivot Bouillon de Culture questions. Um, and James Lipton, who did the artist studio, uh, where we asked the same questions to a series of actors. They're actually also taken from a Victorian parlour game. These questions actually originated from that. And we've updated it with a few naked questions as well. Uh, the naked ones, Stephen, were actually answered by luminaries such as Marcel Proust, Oscar Wilde, mm -hmm. Karl yeah. Marx, and Arthur Conan Doyle. So how are you feeling about Oof. this? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to fire some questions at you. Okay. And quick as you can with the answers. Your greatest virtue? Uh, being simple. Your biggest fault? Um, drinking. <laughs> Your favourite word? Ass. No, that's not true at all. Baby bird. <laughs> Obviously. Your, your least favourite word? Baby bird. <sighs> that's true. I'm not okay. making that up. No, that is it's your liking. favourite and yeah. your favourite. Yeah. Okay. Well, I reckon. Okay. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, oh, uh, robins. <laughs> You're going to look back at this and no. go, ah, No, my cat, it? my cat. Okay. My cat is my, um, she's my guard. What's she called? Ivy. Ivy. As in the name of these tables? Yeah, as the name of the table. What's I think that's true, actually. I yeah? think that's definitely true. I think. I think if you're trying to find some kind of spirituality, I think uh, uh, an animal or nature is where you find it. Well, you've got cats, we've got dogs. So yes, I well, exactly. If there. I had a dog, it would be it's a dog. There. Yeah. What turns you off? You, you, what turns I me off? Answered, oh, I didn't um, ask it. What in life? Yeah, just what's um, like a no-go for you? What's like, oh, go away. Oh, street art, statues on the Thames. <laughs> I think that's that that kind of. I, th I think people's um, lowest common denominators. I think the f the people flood towards Ed Sheeran is a massive turn off okay. when they can be a bit more creative. He said profoundly. It's a good answer Pops, that one. Yeah. That's a good answer. Pumpsy, okay. but yeah. Your idea of happiness. Ooh, doing nothing and being happy. It's the hardest thing to do is doing nothing, just being there. Being there, living in the moment. She's actually on my ring. It is actually. I'm, I'm not. Re I'm not really one for uh, you know stupid phrases, but I think that is true. In the moment. Yeah, live in the moment. Yeah, which I can't do. That's why I desperately need to do it. You can't do it, right? I find it very. I think it's the hardest thing to do is to just yeah, go yeah. right. That's it. It's not a Zen thing. I'm not into all that. Do you forget to do with music sometimes because you're thinking about what you're going to do next rather than just going yeah, to the, the same thing. Well, the best thing about music is that you are in the moment. You are, you're there. You're not thinking. The best thing about music is that you clear your head of everything. Playing the piano, I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not thinking about toothache. I'm not thinking about things I have to organise or drinking, anything. And I've, I've never done, even though I said the virtue was, you know, the music uh, drinking thing, I've never very rarely written music drunk yeah. or drinking that yeah, means that yeah. means that it's better than drinking if that makes sense sort of sacred slightly. it's sacred yeah, yeah. So it's like vinyl outside. it's like naked like, vinyl <laughs> it's a sacred thing your idea of misery we haven't, have I, i'm so bad at asking these questions your idea of misery what what is my idea of misery yeah. um living in nottingham on the dole not knowing what i wanted to do <laughs> Right, if you were a colour, what colour would it be? Black, because it's slimming. <laughs> <laughs> See this, I'm wearing blue today. I know this is in black and white, but I'm wearing blue. That's that's my venture out of yeah, dark colours. Uh, you know. yeah, it's, uh, 
It's a nice shade, the navy. It's a nice shade. Yeah. Um, I think black is the, the also black is not seen as a colour. So I think it's like the it's been pushed out of colours. Don't bring it back into colours. This isn't one of the questions from this, but were you a goth? No, no. no just just no. asked because no, no, Joy no. Division black. I think a lot of goths are not happy with the way they look, so they pile on loads of makeup. To make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Uh, what is your favourite swear word? Well, we were talking earlier and you said dickhead, which I wouldn't have thought of. There's obviously, I think I use the C word too much on stage. Yeah, you've been told off before that, haven't you? Yeah, but I did use the phrase weasel rabbits. I called someone weasel rabbit skunk once, which I think is my best put down. But yeah, no, 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 the C word's terrible. It's very lazy, but it's, it's all swear words are like a, a, a hammer blow. You know, yeah. you say fuck, you say whatever. So I don't really see it as an offensive thing. I see it as like um, hammering something home. So, uh, arse, maybe, I don't know. All of them are great. Come on. <laughs> Use them as much They're as you brilliant. can. They're all brilliant, yeah. You've given me wine. What am I supposed yeah. to say? Um, <laughs> if you could work with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Dead or alive? Um, Oh God, I've no idea. Dead or alive? You mean musically or? Well, anything, any, any, anything. But probably with you, music probably would be. I don't think I, I've never really wanted to work with anyone. Maybe Bud and Jimi Hendrix? No. No, no. It'd be solo and all over the place, no. wouldn't he? We've stayed in Jimi Hendrix's London house. Is that the uh, house he but died I'm, in? But I'm not really into anything. guitar solos, so I'm not really a Hendrix person. What about working with uh, a former men member of Kajagoogoo? Oh yeah, but they're all, they're, they're, they're alive though. Aren't they? they're, yeah, unfortunately. No? Okay. Yeah, they're still. You haven't chosen anyone. Come on, just um, someone that you'd like to work with. What would have been interesting? It's just co it's a bit corny. I mean, I'd probably say David Lynch, but it wouldn't it wouldn't work. It's oh, it different. Different. Imagine mm. you doing a soundtrack to a Lynch movie. No, uh, he likes Julie Cruz. Is it Julie Cruz? Yes. Yeah. And. Um, Who's it, Lana Del Rey and all well, that? You could write a song for Judy Cruz to sing. Yeah, no, that would be quite you fun. That would be quite fun. David, come on, it's time. <laughs> okay, next up, tell us a secret about yourself. A secret? Um, I'm transsexual. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> 